Good morning and welcome to the Catechism in Two Full Months. My name is Pastor Jay Lutz, and today we are continuing through the Book of Concord, the Confession of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. Uh, yesterday we just finished the uh, historical context of the Reformation uh, in the form of the Augsburg Confession and the Apology as we're going through uh, the Catechism, uh, this Book of Concord, in 62 days. It's a big undertaking, and today we are going to be going through the small called articles, from the preface all the way to Article 5. It's a lot to cover, but I mean, we're not pairing it with any other book. We're just going strictly uh, through the small called art article, and this is a doc doctrine um, of the Dr. Martin Luther, uh, written in the year 1537 in, um, in opposition to the confessions of the Pope and the Roman courts at the time, and so uh, he is defending his, his faith before Pope uh, Paul III, and so uh, we're going to read about some of the things that he was up against uh, as he and the reformers seek to um, to continue to persevere against trials mm -hmm. and to um, try to not deceive it. People, but that that they might speak the, the words of Christ um, to the people. So I thought a good reading we can do is James chapter one verses two to eight and twenty six to twenty seven. So let's read together. James chapter one verses two. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any who lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. The man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all that he does. Verse 26. And if anyone considers himself religious, and yet does not keep a tight ring on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Here ends the reading. So this is what the reformers were trying to do, is that they were um, persevering against the ungodly things that were being taught in the churches. Um, they They did not give in to the doubt. Uh, they held strong to the scriptures and that their religion um, was not worthless because they tried to keep the rain on their tongue uh, and to accept that they, they were working towards um, looking after the orphans and the widows in distress and keeping themselves from being polluted by the world. Uh, they saw the church going down the road of being trying to be in uh, collaboration with the world and that the things that they were doing were causing, they were heaping um, burdens upon the orphans and the widows and those who were most vulnerable in the population and people by ma in masses were committing suicide, which we see today is also a problem. So we also, as God's people, still have to keep that in mind that we don't burden those who are um, th those are who are most vulnerable in our population, uh, but that we relieve them by by teaching them and preaching to them uh, the trueness of the gospel, the true religion that is uh, one that um, keeps us unpolluted from the world and keeps those who are most vulnerable protected. So this is what the reformers were trying to do in the matter of the so small cold article. So let us begin. The preface of Dr. Martin Luther. Pope John Paul II, the third, called the council to meet at Manitou last year around Pentecost. Afterwards, he moved it from Manitou, so that it is still not known where he intends to hold it or whether he can hold it. We, on our side, had to prepare for the eventual eventuality that whether summoned to the council or not, we would be we we would be condemned. I was therefore instructed to compose and assemble articles of our teaching in case it came to negotiations about what and how far we would or could compromise with. With papists, and in which things we definitely intended to persist and remain firm. 
Consequently, I assembled these articles and submitted them to our side. They were also accepted and unanimously confessed by us. It was resolved that they should be publicly submitted, presented as the confession of our faith. Should the Pope and his, and his adherents ever become so bold as to convene a true free council in a serious and genuine spirit, without deception and treachery, as would be his duty. But the Roman court is so dreadfully afraid of free counsel, and so shamefully flees from the light, that it is deprived even those who are on the Pope's side of the hope that he will ever tolerate a free council, much less actually convene one. They are understandably greatly offended, and are quite troubled when they observe that the Pope would rather see all of Christendom lost and every soul damned than to allow himself or his followers to be reformed even a little bit to permit limits on his tyranny. Therefore, I still wanted to publicize these articles through the public press in case, as I fully expect and hope, I should die before a council could take place. For the scoundrels who flee from the light and avoid the day are taking such great pains to postpone and hinder the council. I wanted to do this so that those who live and remain after me will have my testimony and confession to present in addition to the confessions that I've already published. I've held fast to this confession until now. By God's grace, I will continue to hold to it. What should I say? Why should I complain? I'm still alive. Every day I write, preach, and teach. Yet, there are such poisonous people, not only amongst our adversaries, but also unfaithful associates who want to be on our side and who dare to use my writings and teachings directly against me. They let me look on and listen, even though they know that I teach otherwise. They want to conceal their poison under my work and mislead the poor people by using my name. What will happen in the future after my death? I suppose I should respond to everything while I'm still living. But then again, how can I alone stop all the mouths of the devils, especially those, for they are poisoned, who do not want to listen or pay attention to, to what we write. Instead, they devote all their energies to one thing, how they might shamefully twist and corrupt the words down to the very letter. I will let the devil, or ultimately God's wrath, answer them as they deserve. I often think of the good Gerson, who doubted whether one should make good writings public. If one does not, the many souls that could have been saved are neglected. Right? So, just like in our passage reading James, um, we speak up not because of, um, in, in fear, uh, uh, but because we, we, we don't want the, the orphans and the widows and those who are distressed, those who are on the margins, to be um, neglected. But if one does, then the devil is there with innumerable vile evil mouths that poison and distort everything so that it bears no fruit. Still what the gain is seen in the light of day. For although they so shamelessly slander us and wanted to keep the people on their side with their lies, God has continually furthered his work, has made their number less and less, while our number grows larger and larger, and has allowed and continues to allow them and their lies to come to naught. I must tell a story. A learned doctor who came to Wittenberg from France stated publicly in our presence that his king was persuaded beyond the shadow of a doubt that there was no church, no government, and no marriage among us, but rather that everyone carried on with each other like cattle, and all did what they wanted. Now imagine how those people, who in their writings have represented as pure truth, such gross lies to the kings and to other countries, face us on that day before the judgment seat of Christ. Christ, the Lord and judge of us all, knows quite well what they lie and have lied. They will have to hear his judgment. That I know for sure. May God bring to repentance those who can be converted. For the rest, there will be eternal suffering and woe. So Martin Luther doesn't desire that anyone um, face eternal suffering and woe, but he's saying that if they don't, uh, if they don't hear his judgment and repent, that's the only option, right? To return to the subject, I would indeed very much like to see a true council in order to assist with a variety of matters and to aid many people. Not that we need it, for through God's grace, our churches are now enlightened and supplied with the pure word and right use of the sacraments, and understanding the various walks of life and true works. Therefore, we do not ask for a council for our sakes. Such matters we cannot hope for or expect any improvement from the council. Rather, we see in Bishop Forex 
Everywhere, so many parishes empty and deserted that our hearts are ready to break. And yet neither bishop nor cathedral canons ask how the poor people live or die. People for whom Christ died. And should not these people hear the same Christ speak to them as the true shepherd with his sheep? It horrifies and frightens me that Christ might cause a council of angels to descend upon Germany and totally destroy us all like Sodom and Gomorrah because we mock him so blasphemously with the council. Um, so here Martin Luther is saying that he, uh, he, he, he's, he's heartbroken, sad. These, these churches are, are losing their people. Um, they're being gutted because of the false doctrines and that, and that the, the shepherds are not leading these flocks in God's rightful manner. And he, he doesn't want um, anything bad to happen to the church because of their um, blasphemous actions. Uh, so he, he wants uh, them to put Christ on his rightful place as true shepherd for his sheep. In addition to such necessity, Necessary concerns of the church. There are countless important matters and worldly affairs that need improvement. There is disunity amongst the princes and the estates. Greed and usury have burst in like a great flood and have attained a semblance of legality. Wantonness, lewdness, extravagant dress, gluttony, gambling, conspicuous consumption of all kinds of vices and weaknesses, or wickedness, disobedience of subject, servant, Labors, extortion by the artisans and the peasants, who can list everything, have so gained the upper hand that a person could not set things right again with ten councils and twenty imperial diets. If participants in the councils were to deal with the chief concerns in the spiritual and secular states that are opposed to God, then their hands would be so full that they would forget all about the child's games and fool's play of long robes, great tonsures, Broad cinctures, bishops and cardinals, hats, croziers, and similar clowning around. If we had already been following God's command and precepts in the spiritual and secular state, then we would have found the spare time to reform food, vestments, tonsors, and chasubles. But if we swallow such camels and strain out gnats, or let logs stand and dispute about specks, then we might just as well be satisfied with such a council. So what he's saying is, instead of concentrating on the things that matter, they concentrate on all these, um, on these things like vestments and whatever else that don't actually matter. They're they're so worried about um, the outward appearance and not the inwardness of the heart. That he says, if we swallow camels and strain out gnats, I mean, so that's the opposite of the way that it, it should be. Um, that we there's a lot of hypocrisy that's going on at this time. That people are pointing out the bad things in other people when they themselves are unwilling to deal with the own log in their own eyes. So as Jesus calls us to um, look inwardly at our own before we start pointing fingers at others. I therefore have provided only a few articles because in any case we already have received from God so many mandates to carry out in the church, in the government, and in the home that we can never fulfill them. But is the point, what is the use of making so many decretals and regulations in the council, especially if no one honors or observes the chief things commanded by God. It is as if God had to honor our buffoonery, while in return we trample his solemn commands underfoot. In fact, our sins burden us and prevent God from being gracious to us, because we do not even repent and moreover want to defend every abomination. O oh, dear Lord Jesus, help a council of your own and redeem your people through your glorious return. The Pope and his people are lost. They do not want you. Help us, who are poor and miserable, who sigh to you and earnestly seek you, according to the grace you have given us through the Holy Spirit, who with you and the Father lives and reigns forever praised. Amen. All right, now let's go into the articles. The first part of our article deals with the lofty articles of the Divine Majesty, namely one, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three distinct persons and one divine essence, and nature is one God who created heaven and earth. Two, that the Father was begotten by no one. Uh, the Son was begotten by the Father, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And neither the Father nor the Holy Spirit, but the Son became a human being. That the Son became a human being in this way, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, without male participation, and was born of the pure Holy Virgin Mary. 
After that, he suffered, died, and buried, descended into hell, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, seated at the right hand of God, and the future will come to judge the living and the dead, etc., as the Apostles and the Athanasian Creed and the Common Children's Catechism teach. These articles are no, not matters of dispute or conflict, for both sides confess them. Therefore, it's not necessary to deal with them at greater length now. The second part of the article is about the articles that pertain to the office and the work of Jesus Christ, or to our um, redemption. Here is the first and chief article that Jesus Christ, our Lord and our God and our Lord, was handed over to death for our trespass and was raised for our justifications. Roman four twenty five. And He alone is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John one twenty nine. And the Lord has laid on Him the iniquities of us all. Isaiah fifty three six. Furthermore, all have sinned, and they are now justified without merit by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus by his blood. Romans 3, 23-25 Now because this must be believed, it may not be obtained or grasped otherwise with any work, law, or merit. It is clear and certain that this faith alone justifies us. And St. Paul says in Romans 3, 28 and 26, For you hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law, and also that God alone is righteous and justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Nothing in this article can be conceded or given up, even if heaven and earth, or whatever is transitory, passes away. As St. Peter says in Acts 4, 12, There is no other name given amongst mortals by whom we must be saved, and by his bruises we are healed. Isaiah 53, 5 On this article stands all that we teach and practice against the Pope, the devil, and the world. Therefore, we must be quite certain and have no doubt about it. Otherwise, everything is lost, and the Pope and the devil and whatever opposes us will gain victory and be proved right. So, second article. That the Mass under the papacy has to be the greatest and most terrible abomination, as it directly and violently opposes this chief article. In spite of this, it has been the supreme and most precious of all the various papal idolatries, for it is held that this sacrifice or work of the Mass even when performed by a rotten scoundrel, delivers people from sin both here in this life and beyond in purgatory. Even though the Lamb of God alone should and must be this, as mentioned above, nothing is to be conceded or compromised in this article, either before the, because the first article does not allow it. And wherever there might be reasonable papists, a person would want to speak with them in a friendly way like this. Why do you cling so tenaciously to the Mass? 1. After all, it is nothing but a mere human invention, not commanded by God. And we may discard all human inventions, as Christ says in Matthew 15, 9. In vain do they worship me with human precepts. It is an unnecessary thing that you can easily omit without sin or danger. 3. You can receive the sacrament in a much better and more blessed way. Indeed, it is the only blessed way when you receive it according to Christ's institution. Why do you want to force the world into misery and destitution for the sake of unnecessary fabrications, especially when the sacrament can be had in another and better and more blessed way? Let it be publicly preached to the people that the Mass, as a human trifle, may be discontinued without sin, and that no one will be damned who does not observe it, but may in fact be saved in a better way without the Mass. What do you want to bet that the mass falls of its own accord, not only amongst the mad mob, but also amongst all upright Christians, reasonable and God-fearing hearts. How much more would this be the case were they to hear that the mass is a dangerous thing fabricated and invented without God's will, God's word and will? Number four, because such innumerable unspeakable abuses have arisen through the whole world, with the buying and selling of masses, they should properly be abandoned, if only to curb such abuses. Even if in and of themselves mass, masses did contain something useful and good. How much the more should they be abandoned in order to guard forever against such abuses, since the masses are completely unnecessary, useless, and dangerous, and everything can be had in a more necessary, useful, and certain manner without the mass. Number five. Number five, as the canon of the Mass and all handbooks says, the Mass is and can be nothing but a human work, even a work of rotten scoundrels performed in order that individuals might reconcile themselves and others to God, acquiring the forgiveness of sins and merit grace. 
When the mass is observed in the very best possible way, it's observed with these intentions. What purpose would it otherwise have? Thus, the mass should and must be condemned and repudiated because it directly because it is directly contrary to the chief article, which says that it is not an evil or devout servant of the Mass with his work, but rather the Lamb of God and the Son of Man who takes away our sins. Uh, if some want to justify their position by saying that, that they want to commune themselves for the sake of their own devotion, they cannot be taken seriously. For if they seriously desire to commune, then they do with certainty, and in the best way by using the sacrament administered according to Christ's institution, on the contrary, to commune oneself in a human notion, uncertain, unnecessary, and even forbidden. Such people also do not know what they are doing because they are following a false human notion, an innovation without the sanction of God's word. Thus, it's not right, even if everything else were otherwise in order, to use the common sacrament of the church for one's own devotional life and to pl play with it according to one's own pleasure, apart from God's word and outside the church community. Okay, so I think it's important to note here that it's not saying that the mass or the service or the, the divine or whatever that it in and of itself is evil that's not what it's saying it's saying it's saying if it is used in order so that it becomes an individualistic thing that's wrong we're to meet together as a body of christ so it should not be for the individual but if it's being used in such a way that it's become so corrupted um, that it needs to get rid of it's, there's nothing sinful or wrong with that. It's, the mass is made for people, not um, f to to um, bring us closer together so we, we can praise and worship God. But if it becomes so corrupted, then it can't. The article of the mass will be a decisive issue in the council because were it possible for them to give it to us on every other article, they could give it to us on this one. As Campeggio said at Augsburg, he would sooner allow himself to be torn to pieces before he would abandon the Mass. In the same way I, too, with God's help, would sooner allow myself to be burned to ashes before I would allow a servant of the Mass, whether good or evil, and his work to be equal or greater than the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thus we are and remain eternally divided and opposed to one another. They are well aware that if the Mass falls, the papacy falls. Before they would allow that to happen, they would kill us all if they could do it. Besides all this, this dragon tail, the mass, has produced many noxious maggots in the excrement of various idolatries. First, purgatory. Here, they traded in purgatory with masses for the dead and vigils after seven days, thirty days in a year, and finally with the common week, all, sail all souls day, and soul baths, so that the mass is only used on behalf of the dead, although Christ instituted the sacrament only for the living. Purgatory, therefore, with all its pomp and requiem masses and transactions, it is to be regarded as an apparition of the devil. For it, too, is against the chief article that Christ alone and not human works is to help souls. Besides concerning the dead, we have received neither command nor institution. For these reasons, it may be best to abandon it, even if it were neither error nor idolatry. At this point, the papists cite Augustine and some of the fathers who have supposedly written about purgatory. They suppose that we do not see why and how they use passages. St. Augustine does not write that there is a purgatory and cites no passage of scripture that persuades him to adopt such a position. Said he leaves it undecided whether there is a purgatory or not and says simply that his mother asked to be remembered at the altar or sacrament. Now all this is nothing but the human opinions of a few individuals who can establish no article of faith, something God alone can do. But our papists employ such human words in order to make people believe in their shameful, blasphemous, accursed fairs of masses offered up in purgatory for the souls of the dead, etc. They will never prove such a thing for Augustine. When they have given up their purgatorial mass friars, something Augustine never dreamed of, then we will discuss with them whether St. Augustine's word lacks support from scripture may be tolerated, and whether the dead may be commemorated, the sacrament. It will not do to formulate articles of faith on the basis of the Holy Father's works or words. Otherwise, their food, clothes, house, etc. would also be articles of faith, as has been done with relics. This means that the word of God and no one else, not even an angel, should establish articles of faith. 
Second, as a result of their teaching on the Mass, evil spirits have caused m many rascality and appeared as souls of the departed. They have demanded Masses, vigils, pilgrimages, and other alms with unspeakable lies and cunning. We all had to hold these matters as articles of faith and live according to them. The Pope confirms this along with the Mass and all the other horrors. Here, too, there is no room for compromise or concession. Um, so what's it talking about? It's talking about that they're um, they're upholding the things of the dead more than they are the things of the living, and that the he's saying that the sacrament is meant for the living, not for the dead. And so, if the mass is centered around um, the sacrament of Holy Communion, then it should be centered around life. And if it's not being centered around life, then it loses its whole purpose, and it should be thrown out. So that's why he's saying it's not because he thinks that the mass should just in and of itself be thrown out. Uh, that's what not what he's talking about. Third pilgrimage is masses. The forgiveness of sins and God's grace were also sought here for the mass ruled everything. Now it's certain that lacking God's word, such pilgrimages are neither commanded nor necessary for we can have forgiveness and grace in much better ways and can omit pilgrimages without any sin or danger. Why would one neglect one's own parish? God's word, spouse and child, etc., which are necessary and commanded, and run after unnecessary, uncertain, shameful, devilish will of the wisps, only because the devil has driven the Pope into praising and confirming such practices, so that the people routinely deserted Christ for their own works, worst of all, became idolatrous. Apart from the fact that they are unnecessary, uncommanded, unwise, uncertain, and even harmful. Therefore, here too, there is nothing to concede or give up etc. Let it be preached that it is unnecessary as well as dangerous, and then see where pilgrimages stand. Fourth, fraternities. The monasteries, foundations, and lower clergy have assigned and conveyed to themselves by lawful and open sale all masses, good works, etc. for both the living and the dead. They are not only pure human trifles lacking God's word, completely unnecessary and not commanded, but they are also contrary to the first article of redemption, and therefore they can in no way be tolerated. Fifth, relics. Here so many open lies and foolishness are based on the bones of dogs and horses, because of such shenanigans at which even the devil laughs, they should have long ago been condemned, even if there was something good in them. In addition, they lack, they lack God's word, being neither commanded nor advised, and are completely unnecessary and useless things. The worst part is that relics, like the Mass, etc., were also to have produced an indulgence and the forgiveness of sins as a good work and act of worship. Also, those precious sixth, those precious indulgences belong here, which are given for money, of course, to both the living and the dead. The accursed Judas or Pope sell the merits of Christ together with the superabundant merits of all the saints in the entire church, etc. All this is not to be tolerated, not only because it is without God's word, not necessary and not commanded, but because it is contrary to the first article. Christ's merit is not acquired through our works or pennies, but through faith by grace, without any money and merit, not by the authority of popes, but rather by preaching a sermon that is God's word. So concerning the invocation of saints. So those are all the reasons um, why there's problems with the Mass. Um, because the Mass has included all those things from pilgrimages to relics to indulgences to, to teachings that aren't according with Scripture. So the invocation of saints is also one of the abuses of the Antichrist that is in conflict with the first chief article and that destroys the knowledge of Christ. It is neither commanded nor recommended, has no precedent in Scripture. And even if it were a precious possession, which it is not, we have everything a thousand times better in Christ. Although the angel in heaven prays for us, as Christ himself also does, and in the same way also the saints on earth, and perhaps those in heaven may pray for us, it does not follow from that that we ought to invoke angels and saints. Pray to them, keep fast and hold festivals for them. So, right, there's a difference between intercession and invocation. Intercession means we have people pray on our behalf. Invocation is we, when we invoke the dead, when we invoke others to fill in the two things that only Christ does, which is mediate and the per propitiation of our sins. Uh, that meaning propitiation is that his blood covers us. Um, so 
Um, masses make sacrifice, establish churches, altars, or worship services for them, serve them in still other ways, and consider them as helpers in times of need, assign all kinds of assistance to them, and attribute a special function to particular saints as the Papists teach and do. This is idolatry. Such honor belongs to God alone. As a Christian and saint on earth, you can pray for me, not only in one kind of need, but in all necessities. However, on account of that, I ought not pray to you, invoke you, hold a festival, keep a fast, make a sacrifice, perform a mass in honor, and put my faith in you for salvation. There are other good ways I can honor, love, and thank you in Christ. Now, if such idolatrous honors is taken away from the angels and the dead saints, then the honor that remains will, will do no harm and will indeed soon be forgotten. When physical and spiritual benefits and help are no longer expected, then the saints will be left in peace, both in the grave and in heaven. For no one will long remember, esteem, or honor them simply out of love with no hope of return. In summary, we cannot tolerate and must condemn what the Mass is, what has resulted from it, and what it is connected to so that we may retain the Holy Sacrament in purity and with certainty may use and receive it with faith according to the institution of Christ. So, that's the first two articles. Um, now we're going to go into the third, fourth, and fifth. That foundation and monasteries established in former times with good intention for the education of learned people and decent women should be returned to such use so that we may have pastors, preachers, and other servants of the church, as well as other people necessary for earthly government in cities and states, and also well-trained young women to head households to manage them. Where they are not willing to serve in this way, it is better if they were ab abandoned or torn down than they, with their blasphemous worship, devised by human beings, should be regarded as something better than everyday Christian walks of life and the offices and orders established by God. For all this, too, is contrary to the first and chief article concerning the redemption in Jesus Christ. Furthermore, they, like all other human inventions, are also not commanded not necessary, not useful, or causing dangerous and futile efforts besides. The prophet calls such worship avon, which means wasted effort. So that's the monasteries. Third, third article. Fourth article. That the Pope is not the head of all Christendom by divine right, or on the basis of God's word, because that belongs only to the one who is called Jesus Christ, Instead, the Pope is only bishop or pastor of the church at Rome and of those who willingly or through a human institution, that is through secular authority, have joined themselves to him in order to be Christians alongside him as a brother and a companion, a companion but not under him as a lord, as the ancient council and the time of St. Cyprian demonstrate. But now, however, no bishop dares to call the Pope brother, 